like just fresh right now. So welcome, you have come to the right place to get some hope. And um, we're gonna get started very soon. And I'm gonna I'm gonna go really fast because I want you to hear from all of our speakers. All right. Yeah, people are coming in. We had over 500 people RSVP, and I see the numbers coming in. So welcome, welcome, welcome. And I, I'm just going to get started if we can go to the slides. And for those of you who are on time and early, you have an assignment. Think if there's anyone else you know who would want to not miss this, you can text them right now. We're all organizers here, so think about who else you want to organize to bring to this call and, and they'll be like, damn, thanks for inviting me to that call. So just take a second and think like, oh, I should text that person. They should, they should get it. They should, they should be experiencing this with me. Cause we all, we all need some hope right now around the climate, around our country. And we're, we're gonna get started um, for closed captioning. There's a little closed captioning um, thing down there. We're also live streaming this on Facebook. Um, with Occupied Democrats, Humanity for Progress, all of our friends, thank you so much. Welcome um, everyone who's out there on social media to the, the Climate Hope presentation with MVP. And we're gonna hear um, just, you know, incredible stories from incredible organizers tonight. Um, so thank you all so much, everyone who worked so hard, Elizabeth, Rain, Alex, Jane, the whole team who made this possible. Um, and you're gonna hear an incredible presentation tonight. Um, and especially Julissa, who has been building this climate program um, at MVP for uh, over a year to get to the point where we are now. And we're just so um, proud. And also just wanna shout out Una, who helped co-found this program. I'm Billy Wimsett, I'm the ED of MVP. And what we're gonna get into, oh, and I know some of you wanna just, like, where do I donate? Um, we've set up a special link to the Climate Fund, which is uh, the fund that Julissa manages. And um, so all the money that people give through this will be distributed by Julissa and um, to, to groups. And you can also donate directly to the groups that you hear from tonight. And, um, and I wanna get into, so usually I do, this is our first call of 2022 and usually I do the kind of overview. And tonight our um, new vice president of programs, Costin Rodriguez Wallerman is gonna be, um, is gonna be introducing um, tonight. And, if you didn't see it on the email, we just hired an incredible new senior team. So you're gonna hear from Costin tonight. Um, and and Costin is just an incredible organizer. Everything at MVP feels so wonderful right now. It's like, we just brought in this incredible senior team who's who's gonna help us take everything to the next level. And Costin has you know over 20 years of, of organizing experience. And, including um, being one of the main people to really push um, climate when he was at the ACLU. And I'm just gonna pass it right over to you, Costin, um, and to take it from here. Thanks so much, Billy. I'm super thrilled. Um, and I'm thrilled that not only is this the first briefing of the year, but it's also my very first briefing with MVP. I'm so thrilled to be joining such a leaderful team, and I can't think of a more strategic place to be working right now. I spent the last two years at the ACLU focused on racial justice campaigns, including immigration and climate justice campaigns. And in that time, it was reaffirmed for me that we need to continue to build grassroots power at the state level, from the most intimate local elections to the top of the ticket. This is no surprise to anyone here. If we lose the midterms, the GOP will be able to entrench their power so deep, it will be a threat to our planet, our communities, and our democracy itself. Winning is frankly our best chance at making the 2020s a truly progressive decade, probably even beyond some of our dreams. Climate justice is of special importance to me for many reasons. I was fortunate to grow up in Denver, Colorado, and I saw the mountains every day. 
I went to high school in Estes Park. I learned to fly fish as a teen from my uncle. My aunt is a botanist who gives climate talks at her Lutheran church. I don't have a sense of direction because the mountains were always my guiding point, telling me which direction was west so I could figure out the rest of the where I was going, quite frankly. So I'm a little lost on the East Coast. My grandparents were migrant farm workers from Mexico, and there's no doubt in my mind that my grandfather's life was cut short by the chemicals and conditions of that work. And now that I have a toddler, there's a hot fire in my soul driving me to ensure a future for her, one where she has the resources she needs and the sustainable environment. And I want to ensure she lives in a multiracial democracy that actually lives into our values of justice, liberty, and happiness. So we got to fight for it all, our planet, our food, our water, our culture, and our democracy. So what's our path to victory? Elections, state work, local work, or issue work? The answer is yes, yes to it all. Let's take a look at our map. If you're familiar with MVP, you've seen this map before. We have a 50 state strategy, and within this strategy, we prioritize states based on a combined analysis of presidential, Senate, House, and state level priorities. Each election is an opportunity. Connecting with individuals about issues that impact their daily lives is also an opportunity we must lean into. At MVP, we invest in specific issues and communities. We take the deep view of politics and we don't pack up after an election. We stay and our groups stay and fight for meaningful policy change to win tangible improvements in their community members' lives. Our issues and community foci include AAPI organizing, Black-led organizing, climate voter organizing, immigrant power, LGBTQ voters, Muslim voters, native voters, and youth and students. Like I said, we have to fight for it all, our planet, our food, our water, our culture, and our democracy. Our community partners are at doors, on the phone, in people's DMs, in the halls of power, on the airwaves, everywhere, contesting for power, contesting for a future. That's why I'm at MVP, because we know we can win at all of these levels if we hustle hard and smart with our communities. And Julissa, our Climate Justice Fund Director, knows how to hustle for our planet and our communities. I am so grateful for her leadership, and I'm sure after this briefing, you will know why. Julissa, I hand it over to you. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much, Costin, uh, for that wonderful uh, backstory and introduction. My name is Julissa Arce Mendez. I am the director of the Climate Vote Fund here at MVP. I'm currently coming to you from Tiwa Pueblo land in Corrales, New Mexico. Oh my gosh, you have no idea how long we waited for this. Uh, we've just been so eager to share the work that we've been doing here in the last couple of years and share stories um, from our partner grantees on the ground. Um, and to also share a little bit about myself because I know a lot of you don't know me. Um, I do want to sort of piggyback on what Billy said. I wanted to just thank also um, Una and the Vervain Foundation, all the amazing donors who have already given to this work. Um, I hope you know, you get to see like what your money is going and like how you're supporting organizations. And if, you know, you haven't donated yet, I hope that you feel really inspired too. Um, you know, I wanted to give a little bit of context around why we called this particular briefing Climate Hope. And the reason is simply because the climate conversation is kind of depressing. Um, you know, a lot of times it really lacks the most important part of our story, which is the magic that exists when people come together in resistance and joy. And we didn't want to focus so much on like what all of us already know, um, you know, the urgency of this moment, uh, but rather really shift the narrative to one that so many frontline and BIPOC communities live on a daily basis. The will, the desire, and the vision of a just and equitable future 
that centers ancestral resistance and a way forward for future generations. Um, ever since I was little, I have just always felt a deep connection with nature and a deep responsibility to protect her. Uh, this was instilled in me by my grandmothers, who you'll see in a second. Um, it is, you know, their connection to nature was just really a way of life. And they both came from families uh, of farm workers, that's them, uh, in Puerto Rico. Uh, they worked multiple um, farm, farming jobs, including um, sugarcane and, and flowers. And, you know, they weren't environmentalists in the ways that we really think about it, but instead shared their unspoken connection with nature by living it on a daily basis. It was this deep connection that really drove me to pursue work in organizing. And like many people, after many trials and errors in real estate and retail and you name it, um, I was finally given the opportunity to organize uh, in climate justice in my hometown of Orlando, Florida. And it was through this role that I really got to understand that our climate crisis is actually a people and systems problem, which is rooted in the same causes as racial and economic injustices. I saw firsthand how these issues impacted my community. Community members suffered from illnesses such as asthma, cancer. They worked multiple jobs and still weren't able to afford basic needs such as groceries. I witnessed all the ways that these systems were stacked against the most vulnerable. And during this time, while I was organizing, Central Florida was experiencing an exodus of hundreds of thousands of Puerto Ricans in the area. My people were dealing with the outcomes of decades long economic crisis that spurred a decaying infrastructure, the closing of public schools and budget cuts to social services and pensions all that to pay back a $73 billion illegal debt to vulture capitalists and bondholders. Then in 2017, Hurricane Maria hit the Caribbean and I saw my ancestral land of Puerto Rico in the throes of utter chaos and destruction. My people did have no power, no gas, no water, no food. Hurricane Maria made matters much worse creating one of the worst climate fuel disasters on par with Hurricane Katrina and Superstorm Sandy. The infrastructure that was left crumbled completely. And what did we get after all of that? I know the slide may be a little, there we go. Um, you know, the response that we got from the government with, from then President Trump was him throwing a paper towel into crowds during a press conference. And an atrocious response to the disaster from FEMA that left over 4,600 dead. Continued proof of Puerto Rico's colonial status. Despite these challenges, our community was strong and I witnessed the magic that happens when we come together, when we organize and we help one another. I experienced hope at the center of a climate fueled disaster, but you know, during those relief efforts, I saw groups who were really holding down the fabric of their communities. They were creating mutual aid networks, solidarity kitchens. They were cleaning up, um, organizing. Um, they were being disproportionately left out of conversations and critical resources. Again, like so many times before, they didn't have a say in the solutions being implemented in their communities. There was a huge disconnect between donors and funders and those on the ground. And had our communities actually gotten the long-term support that they needed before and during this crisis, we could have prevented the conservative political takeover that followed, which led to even deeper cuts to social services and US-based individuals and companies gentrifying our island. This is all why for the last four years, I've dedicated myself to helping donors and funders move resources to those most impacted and have walked alongside partners in solidarity. The Climate Vote Fund is uh, at MVP, allows me to bridge my backgrounds to support groups and strategies that help us win in key races, pass policies that set the foundations for an equitable and just climate future, and strengthen our climate movements. Since 2019, we've moved over $3.6 million to organizations in 24 states 
who have implemented scalable and effective climate solutions and strategies that help us win elections and meaningful policies. Some of our funding priorities include uh, winning federal and key state power, electoralizing local climate groups. Uh, we do this through various methods. And one of those is uh, supporting groups who are part of our climate capacity building cohort. We also support the strengthening of state alliances and the weaving of a broader climate justice movement. Some of the work that our partners do include stopping fossil fuel infrastructure, advocating for stronger environmental protection policies, power building through civic engagement, and cross-issue alliance building, and much, much more, which you'll hear from today. Like our partners, uh, Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition, who knocked on over 65,000 doors and reached over 50,000 environmental justice voters in their first year of doing C4 work. Or the Florida Student Power Network, who reached over 100,000 young voters and held various direct actions against candidates who took money from polluting industries. Our partner grantees have already made a huge impact. Uh, they're really leading on the ground. So far, this is just a very small fragment of what they've done. Um, they've identified and supported over 70 races with climate champions and opposed countless more. They've elected climate champions. Some of those are Summer Lee for Congress in Pennsylvania, Yasemin Ansari for Phoenix City Council, or Harold Polk Jr. from New Mexico State Senate. They've held dozens of climate events, fought against oil and gas pipelines. Uh, some of those fights include Line 3 and Keystone XL. And they've even filed lawsuits against water suppression bills. Um, we know that resourcing the grassroots is the most effective way to win. And today you'll hear from six incredible uh, speakers who are located in the Southwest and the Gulf Coast. Uh, those are, I'll just name them off, uh, Oriana Sandoval from the Center for Civic Action, Atza Don Chavez from NM Native Vote, Whit Jones from Lead Locally, Chloe Torres and Brandon Marks from the Texas Campaign for the Environment, and Lydia Avila from the Climate and Energy Action Fund. It was very, very, very difficult to choose, you know, what region, what work we were going to highlight. Uh, but to be honest, the, the um, work in happening in New Mexico and Texas was just so incredibly critical for us to, to showcase and um, to really have you hear from. Um, the work happening in New Mexico is an incredible example of what can happen when we resource grassroots infrastructure and what is possible when we win and are deeply involved in power shifting. There has been such amazing work happening here in the state. And we'll also hear from groups in Texas, um, a much bigger and tougher state, but the epicenter of oil and gas and petrochemical companies and industries. Texas is a state that we've been investing deeply in here at MVP. Uh, to change it from red to purple to blue, a vision that is coming to life. And I know that we're going to do it. So let me stop talking and introduce our first speaker. Um, first off, we have Oriana Sandoval, CEO of the Center for Civic Action in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Take it away. Thank you, Yulisa. Buenas tardes. I'm Oriana Sandoval, the CEO of the Center for Civic Action, and I'm joining from my homelands in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Thanks for the opportunity to be with all of you tonight to share the organizing and policy work we've been leading with our partners to advance climate and economic justice issues here in the state. As I reflect on our work, I'm always reminded of the words of my father, who was the 20-year-old Southwest Region Coordinator for the very first Earth Day in 1970, Arturo Sandoval, and the only person of color on the team, when he says, the kind of things that come from air pollution and water pollution are the same kind of things that cause racism, that cause poverty, and that cause hunger in this country. Uh, for our communities, seeking justice continues to be intersectional. We can't talk about climate justice without also talking about economic, racial, and gender justice. So in New Mexico, uh, thanks to the support of the Climate and Clean Energy Equity Fund and other funders like MVP as well, we started the Power for New Mexico Coalition in 2018. And this is a coalition of conservation groups and cross-issue base building organizations 
leading organizing primarily in rural communities and with people of color to advance a clean energy and workforce development strategy for New Mexico. And as many of you probably know, we are a heavily dependent state on gas and oil industry and coal and extractive industries in the state. So it's a big challenge for us and our communities. Um, the mission of Power for New Mexico is to empower everyday New Mexicans that are employed by these uh, industries that live in the communities where this is the only economic opportunity available to be part of the emerging clean energy economy by amplifying their voices in policy discussions and strategies and developing clean energy and workforce development policies for communities that will be directly impacted in this energy transition. So making sure that our communities and gas and oil and coal country are not left behind, but are first in line to have a piece of the, the new apple of this emerging economy that we're trying to build out. We approach New Mexico's energy transition through an economic and workforce development lens, not purely a climate or conservation lens. We're working to develop an economic roadmap that is centered in racial equity a vision that creates jobs, protects our land, and is inclusive for people of color and low-wage workers. Um, so since 2018, Power for New Mexico has had some pretty significant policy wins. Our first foray was in 2019 when we were we engaged in the Energy Transition Act Coalition. The ETA passed in 2019 in New Mexico. It was a landmark renewable energy piece of legislation. Um, it set New Mexico on the forefront in the country around renewable energy targets. And Power for NM was responsible for ensuring that there were workforce development and employment targets in this legislation. So 10% um, of renewable energy projects must employ New Mexico must employ folks from New Mexico certified apprenticeship programs and apprenticeship programs. We also made sure the definition was inclusive enough that it wasn't only limited to union certified programs, but a wide array of programs that our communities have access to. We also were able to fund a study by our Department of um, Workforce Solutions, our Department of Labor here that identified the opportunities and barriers in the transition to a clean energy economy in low, com low income and rural communities, as well as develop a roadmap and recommendations based on these barriers and opportunity to um, ensure that there were increased career and technical education, job, job training, workforce opportunities for our communities. We also um, identified and prioritized disadvantaged communities within this roadmap to prepare for economic development opportunities in a sustainable and clean energy 21st century economy. And in this last legislative session in 2021, we were also able to pass a bill that established the Sustainable Economy Task Force. And this task force importantly also includes an advisory council of 14 community members, many of whom Power for New Mexico was able to identify, vet, and successfully get placed onto this advisory council. Um, the Sustainable Economy Task Force will develop policies to promote the addition of new jobs to, um, statewide to replace the jobs that rely on the extraction or development of natural resources, as well as diversify the state's tax base away from primarily gas and oil revenues. So um, we are excited in New Mexico to be building out this model of what a people of color, low wage worker, immigrant uh, movement looks like to diversify our state, to continue to build out healthy, sustainable, resilient jobs and economies for our communities. And you know, with your support and with support of um, many other funders nationally, we've been able, we've been successful and this year, our goals are, um, you know, if we had about 100,000 extra dollars, we would like to hire a policy and director and coordinator positions to build out the capacity of the Power for New Mexico Coalition, because the demands of our coalition and our leaders being in multiple policy and organizing spaces continues to grow. Also on the C4 side, around $200,000 and C4 unrestricted funds would help to, um, for us to run some campaigns this year in our congressional district too, which is our Southern district. And now thanks to redistricting, which we were also, we also played a huge role in with our partners. 
we have redrawn the congressional maps in New Mexico where now that district is, we have a majority Hispanic voting age population district for the first time in New Mexico. And we are a people of color state and have been for a while. So that's a huge accomplishment. And now we finally have a battlefield where um, our communities can finally get fair representation. And we have an amazing candidate, Gabe Vasquez, that we are all ready to support and get behind. He comes from our communities, from our movement, and has our values. So now's our chance for fair representation in Southern New Mexico and gas and oil country. And then we also have a, an early childhood educational constitutional amendment on the ballot in November. This would um, divert about $1.5 million from our land grant permanent fund, which is funded by gas and oil revenues to be able to fund quality statewide universal early childhood education. So this would be a really transformational investment and policy change for New Mexico and thousands of, of vulnerable families across the state. So thank you so much for your time, for allowing me to be here with you all today, sharing some of our work in New Mexico and definitely look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Oriana. Yeah, I'm just looking at all the comments in the chat. Absolutely, what an amazing speaker and such an incredible work that y'all have done here in the last decade, however long, right? Um, I, these things take a lot of time and that's right, the intersectionality and the ways that we are supporting our communities in innovative ways is how we move forward in climate justice. Uh, next up, we'll be hearing from Atza Don Chavez, the Executive Director of NM Native Vote. Um, they're going to talk about, you know, continue the conversation about New Mexico and the amazing work that they're doing um, in the state and how they're collaborating with the uh, uh, indigenous communities and native communities in the region. All right, uh, off to you, Atza. Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Atza Don Chavez. I'm the ED of NM Native Vote. I'm a member of the Diné community um, in Tenochtitlan, New Mexico, and of Gila Pueblo, also in New Mexico. And you know, leading NM Native Vote and our partner organization, Neva Education Project, is exactly where I've been able to work with New Mexico's 23 tribes, nations, and pueblos and our urban native communities to unite community stakeholders to improve the quality of life for our Native American communities and to protect the continuity of our cultures. We advocate for social, economic, and environmental justice principles through the lens of civic engagement and in building a Native American electorate that is active, informed, and empowered. And together we seek to ensure equal, uh, equity, inclusion, and to secure uh, greater opportunities so that Native American people in the state of New Mexico may enjoy a more healthy and prosperous future. Um, so I echo a lot of the things that Oriana said, um, you know, electing <coughs> officials who will be responses responsive to the needs of our communities and holding them accountable is a continual challenge. <coughs> excuse me, but it's also one of the things that we pride ourselves on and, and enjoy the most. Our folks face a number of barriers to ex exercising their right to vote, such as geographic isolation, often with lack of reliable transportation and poor access to distant poiling and registration locations, non-traditional mailing addresses, lack of residential mail delivery, with limited access to post offices, um, lack of reliable broadband or even cell phone service, as well as strong socioeconomic challenges such as poverty, unemployment. So we work to meet people where they are and to find solutions to overcome overcoming these obstacles, um, which is why we chose to lead the NM Native Census Coalition along with CCP um, and others across the state to count as many natives in New Mexico as possible. And is also why we felt starting and leading the Native Redistricting Coalition was a continuation of that 10 year census process and really what we needed to uplift our communities. And this is how we continue to build progressive power in our communities. The Census Coalition and, and its partners were able to reach over 160,000 Native households. And following the release of the census apportionment data, it was clear that there was both a growth in New Mexico's Native population, but that there was also a pretty significant undercount due to the pandemic. 
New Mexico's native population percentage increase could be greater than the 12% that was recorded. And because of all of the systematic and pandemic and induced challenges, there was a huge uh, undercount of the native population. I think for us, um, along with some of the bills that Audiana mentioned, you know, we are really trying to increase our electorate so that we can have a voice, um, especially in the Navajo Nation where so many of our communities are at the front line of oil and gas and extraction industry. Our largest win to date was getting all three of our tribal redistricting bills in the New Mexico State House, New Mexico State Senate, and congressional district maps passed that contained and secured all 23 tribal, nation, and Pueblos consensus maps. So this was a year-long, generously funded effort that allowed us to meet with each and every tribal nation in the state a number of times with our team of demographers, policy and voting experts, legal folks, tribal consultants, and our staff to get input from each and every tribe in a non-prescriptive way to ensure that their needs were heard and met. We partnered directly with the All Pueblo Council of Governors, the Ad Hoc Redistricting Committee, to produce a set of maps that included um, the maps I mentioned, with the support and guidance of the 19 Pueblo governors of New Mexico, the Hickory Apache Nation, the Navajo Nation via the Navajo Nation Human Rights Council, and the Muscalero Apache Nation. This level of collaboration and consultation between tribal nations that took place was monumental in history making for redistricting in New Mexico. Our foremost guiding principle was that of upholding the doctrine of tribal self-determination, our right to decide where those lines needed to be in the state. Our leaders had been very careful and deliberate in their determinations of which districts they wished their communities to belong to. They came to these decisions based upon shared interests, linguistic similarities, historical connections to one another, and connections to sacred sites and national landmarks that extend far beyond any reservation or tribal boundary. Many folks thought we were crazy, but we felt that it was necessary to have all tribes come, come to a full consensus on the maps we proposed, knowing that we were stronger together. <coughs> it was a huge task, but one that we were able to accomplish <laughs> within 48 hours of the start of the redistricting special session. Our goal as the Native Redistricting Coalition <clears throat> was to advance and support district plans to improve and maintain the voting strength within Native American majority districts. <coughs> I was fine until I had to speak, I'm so sorry. We were able to hold our legislators accountable to passing the maps that maintain the full tribal consensus despite so much pressure to say, hey, what about this? What about this change? What about that change? And we were able to utilize our um, partnerships with folks like Power for New Mexico, CCP, and the People's Map, People's Power Coalition to help hold our stand. This allowed us to advocate for maps that are fair and have consent from our tribe. So we'll help build our native voter block, working along with our BIPOC and NGO coalition partners. As I mentioned, Oriana, uh, the People's Map, People's Power, our national partners, the Native American Rights Fund, the National Congress of American Indians, and New Mexico's ACLU. Much of our work is accomplished through civic engagement, voter registration, outreach, and education directly to our communities all of which informs our climate and our Diné energy policy. We continue to strategize to build power within the Navajo Nation. Native voters, even in districts without a true majority, can often be the deciding factor whether or not someone is elected. And tribes are very strategic about those districts they ultimately vote in exactly for that reason. In 2018, the native vote inside Congressional District 2 was a little over 5,000 voters. That Democrat won in an upset by a margin of about 3,000 voters. In 2012, a native woman ran for a Senate uh, seat in a non-native majority district, and she lost by, seven, by 12 votes. The margins are very thin, and if tribes get together in unison to vote for specific candidates, they can be a major political power in New Mexico. It takes a lot of hard work, collaboration, and really uniquely good candidates to be able to capitalize on that. And I will say that in that 12 uh, vote margin area, we were able to make that 
a um, uh, influence district so that the, the next um, election we may be able to sway that particular vote. There is a break in the pipeline from native leadership um, to civic engagement and then to actual non-tribal governmental leadership. But this is something that NM Native, Ver, um, NM Native Vote, excuse me, is working to solve. We have a lot of opportunities, this election cycle and strategies that we want to use to maintain progressive power um, for the native electorate. Uh, electorate. We make up about 12% of the state's population and we are so close to having a Native American caucus in the legislature that is proportional to that amount of population in the state. It's gonna take a lot of work to get there and we're gonna to have to really invest in organizing within our communities when working with our partners um, to push for policies like the Native American Voting Rights Act to address the barriers that our people face in, in exercising their right to vote. Furthermore, these redistricting rings are significant because they place many of our precious cultural and historical landscapes such as Chaco Canyon, which is my background here tonight, within Native American majority districts. This was very intentional. We want to elect Native American leaders to these districts who are champions for our sacred sites, who, who champion environmental justice, who understand why these spaces are so important to us, who are in opposition to national uh, natural resource extraction, and who are prioritize the health of our communities <clears throat> so that we can sustain our cultures and traditions for generations to come. Our communities are frontline. We have borne the brunt of health disparities living in heavily extractive areas. My own family has had to deal with respiratory disease and have fought or have died due to the large amount of VCOs and toxins surrounding our communities. So our plan is to continue to build an active and informed Native American electorate that can reach young people and build voters for life. Most of the people that we see advocating on behalf of climate and environmental justice are our youth. These are the people that are gonna be here when I'm long gone. And these are the people that we need to stand up <coughs> on behalf of our environment. We have recently hired an Albuquerque organizer who's going to lead our youth program. We have an excellent Diné Energy organizer, Joseph Hernandez, who is based out of Shiprock, New Mexico and works primarily on the C3 side of our organization. But we hope to also add an additional organizer in the next few months. Joseph works within his community and surrounding Navajo chapter communities to advocate for a just transition away from the fossil fuel economy towards a renewable energy future that is powered by Navajo workforce. Oriana mentioned the Sustainable Economy Task Force. We have a number of people within our community that are a part of that task force to help lead in that direction. Last year, Joseph did an incredible amount of work despite the pandemic and bringing in the early stages of vaccine distribution to do education on a bill relating to community solar, as well as that economy task force. We had him running around with a Wi-Fi hotspot trying to get our community members to engage in the legislative process. This bill is gonna expand solar access to our renters, to low-income families, to tribal governments and residents or those who otherwise don't have the means to install rooftop solar, as well as the Sustainable Economy Task Force that will provide recommendations for economic diversification with the input of our frontline community members. We have them attend chapter meetings and spend lots of time talking to our community members about the benefits of these policies and how we can utilize them within our communities. During the session, as I mentioned, he ran around trying to provide public comments in support and it was a huge feat because of the lack of broadband in these rural communities. And his dedication earned him national recognition and he was awarded the Dr. Espanola Jackson Solar Justice Award for the work that he did to help community solar get passed. We appreciate the generous support of climate funders because we want to begin an air quality monitoring program on the Navajo Nation. And we hope to work to develop our own policy along with Power for New Mexico and our climate NGO um, partners. The energy issues facing the Navajo Nation are many and they are complex. And we hope that you continue to help support the frontline communities who are working 
based on the needs of the community man members themselves. Thank you very much for your time and support. Thank you so much, Atza Don. Yes, so incredible. Thank you all for the incredible work, for the collaboration, for the coalition building that y'all are doing, the really deep work in the grassroots to really move the needle and to really set the foundation for our future generations to come. Um, our next speaker is Whit Jones. Um, he is a campaign director for Lead Locally. He's gonna tell us a little bit about his work, um, his down ballot work, which is really exciting. Uh, I know there's not a lot of like hope right now with what's happening federally, but I hope that what Whit's gonna share is gonna be super exciting. Uh, it's gonna get you all pumped. Whit, take it away. I think you're oh, on mute. Wait, you're muted. Got it. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, thanks so much for having me. Uh, and so great to be on, really inspired by all the amazing partners that we have on this call tonight. Um, I'm excited to share a little bit about our work at Lead Locally. Uh, we're a C4 that's really focused on building power and winning local elections where there's something critical at stake on climate or in environmental justice. And as Julissa just mentioned, you know, and as all of you know, uh, things are pretty stalled in Washington, DC right now, despite, you know, heroic campaigning and organizing from partners and allies. Uh, the good thing is that many of the decisions on climate and fossil fuels are actually made at the state and local level. So that could be a city council uh, considering whether or not to build a new gas plant, a county commission deciding whether or not to zone in a, a pipeline, a port commission on whether or not making decisions on whether or not we're going to export fossil fuels overseas. Um, these local bodies actually have a ton of power. And uh, we and our, and our partners and organizing groups can have a lot of power in those decisions when we get involved in the advocacy and the electoral work. And I, I see that across the country um, because on the local level, we see less dirty money. Our opposition is not, you know, they are spending money in these local elections, but it's not at the scale that we see in federal elections. And these polluting projects are unpopular. You know, people don't want them locally. Uh, and so if they can be educated on the impact of them, and understand how to get involved in decision-making on it, they can have a huge amount of power uh, and help us to stop them. We can go to the next one. And despite all the progress we are making uh, across the country, when we zoom out and look at climate, we still have a ton of work to do. Um, we are somewhat on track for some the Paris climate goals, uh, but it is not fast or ambitious enough uh, to actually save our climate. Uh, you can see here, uh, part of the reason I think uh, the states we're talking about tonight, New Mexico, Texas, I would also throw Louisiana in there, are so critical. And it's because they sit on the Permian Basin, which is one of the last uh, major unexploited basins of oil and gas. They, they are drilled now. Uh, but as you can see from this graphic, from Great Organization Oil Change International, uh, there is still a lot of oil in the ground, uh, and we need to keep it there in order to protect communities and the climate. And while there's drilling planned in the Permian Basin, uh, it's planned to go through pipelines uh, to the coast of Louisiana and Texas for export. And we're going to hear a lot more about that from the next speakers in, in Texas. Um, but overall, uh, there's still uh, a humongous threat across the country. There's this drilling uh, in the second I'll show slide that shows there are still 270 proposed oil, gas, and petrochemical projects in the country. Um, so we have a lot of work to do. Go to the next slide. Um, and we know that cumulatively that stopping these projects, uh, engaging our cities and states has real impact. A study from Bloomberg Philanthropies 
uh, showed that it was just state and local action alone that would help us reach 75% of our commitments to the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, on the other side of it, showing we have more work to do, uh, Rhodium Group, which is uh, a consulting group that analyzes uh, various energy policy, they looked at the Build Back Better plan that has been considered in Washington, D.C. Uh, and not only do we need to pass that, we would also need to pass major policy in 25 states in order uh, to hit our climate goals. And those include major oil and gas states like New Mexico, Louisiana, California, Colorado, according to their model. Go okay, next. Uh, there are some huge elections in 2022, not just uh, on the federal level and in Congress, but there are some big elections, you know, just beneath the surface uh, on climate and energy issues. We just heard about the importance uh, of um, transitioning the oil and gas industry in New Mexico. There's a statewide regulator uh, who's up for re-election this year. Uh, Chevron spent $3 million to try to avoid her getting into office last cycle, um, and they'll likely be back. Uh, there are also public utility commission elections this year uh, in Arizona and other states. And as we'll hear more, state houses also have a huge impact on whether or not a state moves on climate, energy, and environmental justice policy. And the Pennsylvania State House uh, was just redistricted and is looking favorable for us picking up Democrats and environmental champions who could help shift the state. And beyond that, uh, there will be tons of local elections uh, this November and in, in the lead up uh, again along the Gulf Coast and West Coast where fossil fuels are really at play. I can go to the next slide. Uh, this is a map of the 270 proposed oil, gas, and petrochemical projects uh, compiled by a great partner, the Environmental Integrity Project. And uh, we're just in the process of finishing up a data analysis of these projects to try to figure out which of them uh, seem vulnerable to stopping them through uh, local organizing and building local power uh, to advocate against them. Um, so the layer you see on top of it, the purple, is a partisan score from Target Smart. You often see these scores applied to uh, a congressional district or big elections. We downscaled it to the local level where these projects are proposed. Um, you can go to the next slide. And you can see in a lot of the states where there is a heavy convergence of oil and gas projects proposed, uh, they're placed in places uh, that are competitive districts. The Gulf Coast of Texas, which again, we'll hear more from our friends at TCE. In Pennsylvania, there's still lots of gas plants and uh, infrastructure associated with pipelines. Uh, and Louisiana, uh, don't have time uh, to talk through extensively, uh, but similar in Louisiana, which is a difficult state politically, uh, many of the most egregious projects are proposed in, um, in districts and counties where we can win. Um, so just wanna leave that with you all as we go on uh, and continue this work. Um, very excited to be here and um, yeah, thanks again. Thank you so much, Whit. Super informative. And I know that when you're done with that project, you're gonna send us out the link so that we can learn more and you know, just learn how do we support the groups who are on the ground um, where there is a competitive uh, district or race that we can really stop fossil fuel infrastructure because it really boils down to, in a lot of cases, to these very hyper local races. And, you know, they could be like one by 12 votes, um, like we saw um, how Asa was talking about earlier. So, you know, it's really critical for us to really think about the hyperlocal, the state, the region, and the country in, in terms of um, not only this election, but other elections. Um, next off, we are uh, going to dive deeper into Texas. We actually have two amazing speakers from the same organization, uh, one of our partners, Texas Campaign for the Environment. 
Uh, first off, we have Chloe Torres, who is the Coastal Bend Fossil Fuel Expert Campaign Organizer. Take it off, Chloe. Hello, everyone. What an honor to be here with you all. Um, so yes, my name is Chloe Torres, and um, I was born and raised in the city of Corpus Christi that lies to the Gulf of Mexico. And so although abundant in natural beauty and rich cultural heritage, we have a serious problem here. Fossil fuel build out that disproportionately impacts communities of color in my uh, majority Latinx hometown. So since 1935, Corpus Christi has constructed and operated oil and gas refineries. And due to racist urban planning, these refineries will, were built right next to the city's historically black neighborhoods. The growth was so large that this area of the city to this day is known as Refine Row, and it is infamous for high rates of pollution, as well as elevated rates of asthma, cancer, and birth defects. And so this is a view of Refinery Row from a resident's backyard. More recently, residents around the coastal bend have been subjected to a new oil, gas, and petrochem build out. The port of Corpus Christi is now the largest exporter of crude oil in the United States. Chenier, the largest exporter of LNG, again, in the, in the entire nation, is expanding their Corpus Christi site. And so despite pushback from the community, Exxon and Saudi-owned Sabic built the world's largest ethane steam cracker, which will feed the production of nurdles or tiny pellets that form the building blocks for plastic products. And so this is just one example, this image here, of the plant's terrifying ground flares that residents are subjected to on a regular basis. And so if these flares weren't scary enough, the plant was given a massive portion of the municipal water supply, leading my city to literally run out of water. The city and the Port of Corpus Christi have since tried to sell residents on the idea of desalination, which would extract water from our bay, remove the salt, offer potable water to new polluting facilities, and then dump the waste byproduct back into the bay. And so sadly, my city is just one of many in Texas and Louisiana that is being bombarded with crude oil and liquefied natural gas construction and expansion um, as you can see on the map on the, on the next slide. So what you are looking at is an attempt by the fossil fuel industry to lock communities like mine into oil and gas dependency for decades to come. And far too long, we have witnessed politicians on the local, state, and federal levels take oil and gas money for their campaigns while myself and, and um, my loved ones are left to fend for ourselves when natural disasters made worse by climate change destroy our homes, when we have to pay for expensive hospital visits due to our worsening respiratory health, and when we experience mass layoffs, when these fossil fuel projects become too expensive to maintain or the companies decide to hire out of towners instead of locals. And so that is precisely why my organization Texas Campaign for the Environment is coalition building with nonprofit organizations and grassroots ones, not only locally and across the nation, but from around the world to build the people power we need to fight and win against this fossil fuel apparatus. And so through coalition building and digital organizing, we were able to turn out over 20,000 comments denouncing the permitting of the Blue Water Oil Terminal which if built would be the largest oil export terminal in North America. A single TikTok that was viewed 29,000 times got thousands of people to take action to protect our delicate ecosystems from dredging. And so as we draw connections between companies with projects in different places in the Gulf Coast and build relationships with organizations and community members that are fighting back, our campaigns have also become flashpoints in local elections, which my coworker Brandon will talk about next. Thanks, Chloe. Uh, hi, all. My name is Brandon. I'm the Coastal Bend lead organizer with the Texas Campaign for the Environment. I'm going to talk about how year-round organizing turns into campaign and election victories. As Chloe mentioned, 
Oil, gas, and petrochem plants require a lot of water, which is why the city and Port of Corpus Christi are pursuing desalination. Along with our local coalition, we realized that if we stop desalination and cut off the supply of water, we can stop the expansion of water intensive fossil fuel infrastructure like the Exxon Sabic plant that Chloe mentioned. There are three key decision makers on desalination, the city, the port, and the permitting agencies. During Corpus Christi's 2021 budget vote, we generated 75 public comments and conducted a paid media campaign, which I'd love you to see now. The Corpus Christi City Council plans to spend $500 million to build Baywater desalination plants for corporations to use. The city's own water chief said there's not really a benefit for residents. If you want your taxes and water bills to go up, up, up to pay for corporate desal that pollutes our bay, do nothing. But if you want to stop higher taxes and bills and protect our bay, call 239-8585 or visit desaldisaster.com. So as a result of these efforts, fiscal year 22 funding for desalination was cut by a third. And we forced this city council to vote on the record on desal for the first time. Now, when it comes to the port, when a seat on the port commission was up for reappointment, we proposed our own slate of candidates who would put the public good above private profit. Our efforts made front page news in the local paper. The incumbent commissioner was not reappointed. And we helped contribute to changing the narrative around who should serve on the port commission. We also contest the desalination permits at every opportunity. Citing the significant public comment that we helped generate, the EPA decided to exercise their oversight authority on these permits and already issued an initial objection on the permit that's the furthest along. So we've leveraged year-round organizing, paid media efforts, and direct action like you see on this slide that has helped us earn national, statewide, and local election, uh, and sorry, and local news coverage. Um, which you'll see a few highlights of on the next slide. And so these are just a few of the headlines that because of our efforts, we've been able to generate uh, in local, statewide, and national papers, all of which helps us contribute to making desalination a flashpoint issue in local elections. In the 2020 election, we put up billboards that got 3 million impressions. We sent out 138,000 pieces of direct mail, with two of which you can see on this screen, released digital ads that reached 100,000 people, and also made 128,000 calls. As a result of these efforts, we helped unseat the mayor. He was the biggest promoter of desalination, and he was the only incumbent to lose re-election that year. And these are some of the digital ads that we put up during that campaign as well. So now I wanna talk about the 2022 election and you can take down the slides for a minute. So as Chloe and Witt and others have explained, these local city and counties and ports have a lot of sway over the expansion of fossil fuel infrastructure in our communities. We have the opportunity to make real gains in the fight for climate justice by contesting and winning local elections in places like Corpus Christi. Corpus Christi elections are often decided by only a few hundred or thousand votes, and candidates for city council don't usually raise more than 40 or $50,000. And the same is true in a number of small towns along the Texas Gulf Coast that hold elections in May, sometimes with only 100 registered voters. It's in these races where relatively small investments go a long way. And we know that with more resources in this election cycle, we could increase our impact on the political establishment that is pushing through desalination and damaging fossil fuel infrastructure. Right now, we are already building out our field team and or field organizers, but we're also planning out a paid media campaign targeting strategic races in Corpus Christi and other communities up and down the Texas Gulf Coast with direct mail, digital ads, billboards, and TV spots. And we've budgeted out three different scenarios for this paid media campaign, depending on the level of funding we're able to get. We could carry out a robust paid media campaign with multiple touch points per target voter with about $358,000. We could execute a great but slightly less aggressive campaign with $253,000, 
And we could do a more scaled back version that still contributes to achieving our objectives with $176,000. And it's also important to mention that we work in partnership with many allies in Corpus Christi and the Texas Coastal Bend region that are also under-resourced. Building up an ecosystem of strong organizations that work together in partnership is a crucial part of shifting power in our community. And I hope you all have the opportunity to build relationships with many of our allies here too. This has been great and it's awesome to be here. And I just wanna thank you all for your time. Wow! Can we just say wow? Oh my goodness. That is just so inspiring. It's like filling my, my cup. And yeah, I think like just to reiterate, like we don't want our communities are not sacrifice zones. We are strong. We have ideas. We have solutions. We can scale up. We know exactly what we need in our communities and we need to be resourced in order for us to do it. Uh, just so grateful for, for the work that all of these organizers are doing on the ground, for really going out there every single day, really putting themselves, you know, we got to support these frontline communities as best as we can. And um, I'm, actually, our next speaker, we're going to be talking about that because I think that, um, you know, as part of being an MVP, you know, we're not the only funder. And for us, it's part of an ecosystem, right? We're talking about ecosystems of change. And uh, the next speaker is a part of that ecosystem, um, a collaborator, a good friend, um, uh, Lydia Avila. She's a program officer with the Climate Equity Action Fund. And she's gonna tell us a little bit about her work uh, there and, and how we can resource these groups. Take it away, Lydia. Thanks, Elisa. Um, I never get tired of hearing about all this amazing work. Um, thank you. So inspiring. Definitely filled my cup, like you, Lisa, said. Um, and thanks for having me. So I'm Lydia. I'm a program officer at the Climate Equity Action Fund. My background's in organizing. Um, I started organizing 15 years ago as a college student, and I have not stopped since. Um, even in this role, I came into this role um, into philanthropy because I wanted to move money to organizations that I truly believe are doing the most important work in the world, like not exaggerating. <laughs> um, so now a little bit about the Action Fund. Um, the Action Fund, the Climate um, Equity Action Fund provides strategic grant making in 13 states to support um, our grantee partners to win and implement equitable climate policies. Um, these grants support a range of activities um, such as community organizing, policy advocacy, legislative accountability, communications capacity, coalition building, all the things that make up a recipe for success for cl uh, equitable climate policy. Um, this year, the Action Fund um, plans to award at least 5.7 million to over 80 grantee partners in our in our states, um, which actually I will drop in the list here so folks can have that. Those are our 13 states there. Um, so our grantees are typically multi-issue, multi-racial organizations focused on organizing with communities of color. Um, the vast majority of our grantees are run by women and BIPOC folks and have a track record of success in building and wielding political power. So we invest in them so that they can expand their work into climate and energy equity um, and advocate for climate solutions that are led and defined by their communities. Um, because that is at the core of what we believe makes good climate policy. Um, those at the front lines, those most affected, and those per perfect examples in a couple of our speakers today, um, Civ um, Center for Civic Action and NM Native Vote, both grantees of the Equity Fund, very proudly working with them in New Mexico. Um, the uh, Equity Action Fund has three priority areas this year. The first is winning and implementing equitable climate policies. So some examples of our grantees past and ongoing work include 100% um, clean energy and or economy wide emission reduction targets in New Mexico, Virginia, Minnesota, Michigan, um, increasing access to solar energy through expanding rooftop solar programs um, and creating or improving community solar programs um, in Michigan and Illinois, amongst a couple other states. Um, ensuring that the implementation of 100% clean energy statute centers equity and results in emission reductions for frontline communities specifically. Again, that's happening in New Mexico, North Carolina, Virginia. 
um, implementing workforce development provisions in recently passed legislation, such as what we heard in New Mexico and, and what's happening in Illinois, um, and holding um, officials accountable for workforce development provisions, like in New North Carolina's recent executive order. And lastly, reducing energy burdens for low income households. Um, so that's happening in Georgia, Florida, New Mexico, a couple other states. Um, our second priority area is building the voting power of communities of color. So we'll support partners in leveraging more um, uh, voters uh, of color in, in, in their communities. Um, also under this bucket is our climate disinformation war room where our grantees are organizing and fighting back against climate disinformation that seeks to undermine the trust in climate solutions and explicitly targets communities of color. Um, so the, they, they address the political motivation behind this information and they seed alternative narratives, right, that drive action for solutions that are defined by these same communities. And that's actually happening in New Mexico as well. Um, our third and final priority area is, of course, electing pro-climate majorities. So in addition to uh, legislator education and accountability, uh, we're also continuing to support our grantees and protect protecting and building towards a governing climate majority at the state level, specifically state legislatures, governor seats, as well as some elected uh, public utility commissions or like the equivalent of, they're not always called public utility commissions in every state, but basically the equivalent of that if they're elected. Um, 11 out of the 13 states that we work in have gubernatorial races this year. All 13 are focusing on state legislative races and a handful of our states, um, namely Arizona, Georgia, and New Mexico, um, there's also those um, those PUC or, or Public Service Commission um, uh, races that we're keeping an eye on. Um, I would say our competitive edge, you know, and so in a lot of this we share with Movement Voter Project, so like all of this applies to them as well, is that we have long term and sustained investment in the states. We're not in and out. Um, and uh, we don't believe in like off years, right? Like you always got to be funding the work because um, the organizing doesn't stop and, and all that work that happens in between is just as important, if not more important for building the trust of community and keeping folks engaged. Uh, we align our C3 and C4 dollars to maximize the use of those C4 dollars. So we have over a hundred grantees on the C3 side and our C4 grantees are basically the sister organizations of those C3 uh, organizations that we fund. Those are like typically our C4 grantees. Um, we have seen it happen over and over that whenever we take our eyes off the states, it's, it, even for like one year, it sets us back. So we need to be able to um, do that federal and state work at the same time. That's what we believe. Um, uh, just a couple of last things, you know, fall of this past year, so just um, in November, we actually already got several million dollars out to start the work in 2022, because that's what I mean about like getting ahead of it, not waiting till the last minute, because um, frankly, you know, $10,000 in um, in October is like worth way less than if we, you know, if we get that money out the door earlier in the year. Um, you know, functionally speaking, <laughs> um, you know, and we really appreciate working with Moon Voter Project because they can often be more nimble than us. And so I love working with Elisa and others to like figure out how we fund all the organizations, you know, like we can't do that, but maybe you guys can do that and back and forth. We have that kind of rapport and I really appreciate that. Um, and thank you so much for having me. Um, Chet, I'll hand it back over to you, Lisa. Thank you so much, Lydia. Yes, yes, we love the collaboration. You know, Climate Equity Action Fund is one of our, our collaborators. We have others as well. And for us, it's really critical, right, to as we're, you know, moving resources to also impact philanthropy. You know, we have to get folks knowing what's happening on the ground, right, close that gap of knowledge and also shifting philanthropy. Um, that is part of our work, too. Uh, I am just so like excited. I keep on saying, I know I'm like always excited, like, yes, but um, we are just like thrilled that y'all could be here and really listen to these incredible stories from the ground. And like Lydia said, you know, we we wholeheartedly agree that, you know, the, the strategies of the states is really our priority and our groups and partner grantees can't do the work, right? with time if they don't have the resources, right? 
Now we are fundraising for primaries. We're fundraising for, in some states, the end of legislative session. Um, and, and, you know, canvassing in the summer and like volunteer, whatever, you know? So um, we are just like trying to get uh, all the resources that our groups need in, in time so that they can continue doing this, the work um, and doing it really well. Um, and just a quick thing around like the type of uh, support that groups still need. Um, you know, I talked about primaries you know, folks are really looking at um, electing their own, right? We heard that continuously through the thread of, of conversations tonight of we need representation, we need to elect our own, and folks need support to do that ahead of the primaries. Um, we need to support groups to hire and retain staff at living wage, right? They need to get paid for what they deserve and the work, the hard work that they do every single day when they're hitting the ground, they're making calls, they're texting, they're really, you know, supporting the fabric of their communities. So we need to support that. And this type of multi-year, you know, consistent funding allows groups to do more, like do the work, you know, they don't have to fundraise every single year if they know that they have a multi-year commitment to their organization, it just really is a sigh of relief for them. Um, and you know, I'm going to advocate always for that because you know we know we've heard today that that's really what our what our organizations need, um, and not just our organizations, right? Like if we invest in the grassroots and the organizations and our people and our communities, right, that is a change for us, right? We are one, right? We're an ecosystem, we're, we're um, connected in that way. So an investment for them is an investment for us, an investment for the future. And it is also hope, it is hope. Um, and climate change is really a challenge, you know, for us, um, for generations to come. And it will take bold action and giving for us to really meet, um, meet where we're at. Um, so I'm, I'm going to stop talking <laughs> and I'm going to um, pass it over to our amazing new director of donor organizing, Zoe Toby, who's going to talk a little bit about how you can give. Wow. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Zoe Toby. I am MVP's new director of donor organizing. And I am going to talk about how you can give and how you can get involved. Um, as I'm sharing just a little bit, I, I want you to take a moment to uh, pause and just let in everything that you've heard tonight. We heard a lot. And um, I know I'm feeling uh, some, somehow more inspired now than I was even an hour ago. And an hour ago, I was already pretty inspired. So take a moment. Uh, you know, let this in, all that you've heard, and share in the chat, if you're willing, share in the chat just a few words to capture, um, what are you feeling? What are you, what's your reaction uh, hearing all this? And um, I'll give you a moment to, to type, and then, and then I promise I'll, I'll start talking again. <laughs> so grateful. How are you feeling right now, hearing all of this? And, you know, knowing uh, this, this presentation was called Climate Hope, um, are you experiencing more hope uh, after this? Informed, hopeful, revved up, appreciate the energy and courage of these organizers, pumped, so proud to be in this work, excited, hopeful, our hope is each other, hopeful, connected, grateful. Whew. Okay, well, keep it coming. <laughs> and um, I'll, I'll say my piece and then we're gonna go on to some Q&A as well. So keep it coming. I, I just love hearing all your reactions. Um, and I know all of the organizers on the call uh, feel the same. It, you know, it, we wish we could all be in a room together having this conversation. So hearing from you in the chat is the next best thing. So um, uh, the purpose of the donor organizing program at MVP is to build a movement of millions of donors who are funding this grassroots work for the long haul. And uh, I don't have to say anything about why that's important. You've already heard all about that. So um, let me just say, if tonight inspired you the way it inspired me, um, please take a moment, take a moment now, take a moment tonight and donate what you can. Uh, we know that early money goes so much further than um, most of 
what happens in an election year, which is money coming in in the last month, the last two months, uh, these organizers, these organizations, if we can give them what they need now, they can staff up, they can uh, run the, the cutting edge digital ads to take their campaigns to the finish line. Um, so give what you can. You can go to movement.vote slash climate. You can uh, put your phone up to the QR code, use your QR app or your camera and uh, donate that way. And if you're interested in giving a larger gift or um, hearing about other ways that you can donate, you can email us directly at advisor at movement.vote. And um, we are uh, literally giddy to, to hear from you. So please do donate. And um, as you're taking this in, I, I just wanna share a little of the larger context. Uh, you know, here at MVP, we're, we're looking at building a movement of donors because the grassroots climate justice movement needs a movement of donors. And the uh, movement of movements that is made of all of the grassroots groups that MVP funds need a movement of donors to sustain the work. Just imagine how freeing it would be if the organizers you heard from tonight and folks just like them didn't have to put <laughs> a moment of their time or energy toward fundraising because that part was just covered and they could do what they do best. They could do the work that they're made to do, that they're born to do here, which is organize their communities, uh, turn out the vote, and advocate for the policies that their communities need and that all of our communities need. So um, really what you're doing by donating is being a part of this movement, joining into a relationship of solidarity and partnership with these groups in places you might not live, with people you may have never met and may never meet, but becoming a part of the movement together, that's really what we're here to do. So if you'd like to do more than donate, the single best thing you can do is host a virtual house party with MVP. And um, just a little to say about this, uh, think of it like this is our organizing work to do. Our grassroots partners, they're organizing their communities. It's time for us, us to organize ours. So with a virtual house party, it's very simple, very fun, very easy. You invite your friends, you invite your network, you gather together on Zoom. We help you every step of the way, our volunteer team, our staff. You share your love for MVP. Uh, we provide videos, slides, et cetera. We talk about the work. And um, if your community is inspired to give, then uh, you give them a way to do so. So uh, we would love, love, love to have you. We've had uh, in the last election cycle, we had over a thousand hosts and co-hosts coming together, organizing to uh, bring their communities together for virtual house parties. We would love to do uh, that again and more. So sign up. You can go to movement.vote slash host and um, we'll be in touch. You can sign up on the intake form and we'll reach right back out and get it all planned with you. So take a moment. Um, and reflect on what you've heard, uh, how it moves you, and really what's important to you about being a part of this work. I know for me, uh, <laughs> I've, I've always, uh, I actually came into this work as a climate organizer. I've always had the, the uh, motivation to do this work in order to uh, be a, a great citizen of this country and also to be a great ancestor to future generations. And I know for me now as a father of a two and a half year old, uh, that is no longer an abstract concept. So think about who and what it is for you. Uh, why are you here? What calls you to be involved in this work? And then um, take the next step or next steps that are right for you. So with that, we're gonna move right into Q&A. Back to you, Julissa. And uh, thank you everyone so much for being here. Thanks so much, Zoe. Yes, um, we have just a, a couple minutes for Q&A. So if you haven't had a chance to type your question in, go ahead and, and do that now in the chat. Um, I know we had a question earlier about how do I, you know, get in contact with these folks. Um, and I know some of the presenters have put in their emails or their websites. Um, 
we can go ahead and, and um, put in the websites too. Um, so if you want to scroll up, or you, you can take a look at them, or you know, the presenters want to go ahead and do that again, that would be great. Um, the next question is, um, how are people dealing with voter suppression issues? That is such a great question. And I, I was thinking that maybe Atza, Don, or Oriana might want to perhaps answer that or, together. Go ahead, Oriana. I don't even know where to start, Atza. Um, so, I mean, you know, our issue education, our organizing, like we talked about, it's all intersectional and connecting folks to democracy, democratic processes, making those systems more accessible to them is always at the heart of our work. And Atza and I are just getting off a um, hard fought campaign in the legislative session here in New Mexico where we were working in partnership with our Secretary of State and Governor to pass a Voting Rights Act, which would have really enshrined a lot of these access issues and made our um, democratic processes even more accessible. They were tailored for our communities. And unfortunately, because of politics, conservative Democrats, it died. But, you know, this is just the beginning, like it never ends. So we'll be back um, and we're we're doing accountability now on folks who were obstacles to that and letting their constituents know what they did. Um, and yes, like it's it's just part of the battle we fight every day. It's in, it's intertwined. Great, thank you so much. Um, okay. We have another question, and I think I'm gonna tap Zoe. Um, it's a house party question. Is there a kit or description or how to? Zoe? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Uh, as of right now, we have a sample slide deck. We have a sample uh, autoplay video that you can literally just <laughs> press play on Zoom, share, uh, you don't have to know anything about the inner workings of the MVP. It covers the whole thing. Um, and we have a incredibly skilled and experienced national volunteer team who've been running hundreds of house parties over the last few years who are um, <laughs> literally waiting at their inbox for a notification that you signed up uh, as interested to host a house party. As soon as you do that, they reach out to you. They say, hey, here I am. I'd love to help any way I can from start to finish. Um, and uh, uh, so anything that you need help to cover, they can help uh, to, to get you everything that you need. And in the next few months, we're going to be rolling out a lot more things, uh, a, a much more detailed toolkit for step-by-step -step how to create your event from start to finish, uh, a sample event outline, uh, talking points that you can use. So there's plenty that's coming. And in the meantime, we're, we're just getting started. We haven't uh, officially kicked off the house party campaign yet, but this is, um, this is like your chance to get in on the, uh, the ground floor, so to speak. And they're so much fun. Like if you haven't hosted a house party, you should definitely think about doing it. Okay. Um, the next question, and I think that might be our last question, is um, how are you involving students and campuses in, in GOTV efforts? So I was wondering if our folks at TCE could chime in. Sure. So in terms of involving students and youth within the organizing efforts, it's always just so exciting, like being young myself, like finding folks that are even younger to be able to really invest in leadership development and training that like meant so much to me when I was in high school and college. And one thing that's really great about Corpus and the Coastal Bend is having just an incredible coalition of different folks that specialize in different areas. And so for example, here in Corpus, uh, there's an organizer with Move Texas that's focusing a lot on youth organizing, an organizer with Next Gen America that is, spends a lot of time in the local university here. And I believe that the Texas Freedom Network uh, through Texas Rising is soon to be here as well. And so that's three different organizations that are truly dedicated to youth organizing. And it's really exciting that that's a focus that folks are bringing here. 
that anybody else, any of the panelists have anything else to add around that? Um, feel free to. Hi, this is Atta from NM Native Vote. I think for us, you know, we've really invested in an uh, Albuquerque or organizer to work with our high school and our higher education students and really bring them into the fold. We start with a what is power series and a power mapping session and really try to um, have them come to their own um, realization of why this work is so necessary. But I think it's really about building that pipeline and kind of preventing burnout from a lot of the folks that work in this space. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, I think that's it for our Q&A. Thank you all so much for, for asking such great questions. And um, I, we're gonna go ahead and, and do some final thoughts in, in closing. And I just like, I think I wanna, you know, emulate Zoe, just like take a breath and just kind of like process everything that we heard today. All the amazing stories from Oriana and Atza, New Mexico to WIT and uh, the maps and the down ballot uh, opportunities to what's happening in Corpus Christi and the coastal bend uh, to our, our communities resisting being in joy to, to saying no to fossil fuel infrastructure, to say no to environmental racism, to say no to being sacrificed and to really be feeling empowered to, to leave uh, to represent themselves and, and to really take ownership of the solutions that are being, being presented um, at the moment and um, to really center their experiences um, in, this, in this moment. Um, I'm just so grateful to every single one of the speakers, uh, grateful to our, our you know, funder allies at the Climate Equity Action Fund, and so many of our donors who have already given to, to this work. Uh, this is just such a small, you know, incredible, like imagine like all the amazing work that we're talking about. And like, this is like, you know, three groups, right? Like our work expands the country. Um, and I think Chloe had, you know, shared this beautiful picture of, of TCE organizing um, globally. And, and it really is a global fight, right? We have to be in solidarity. We have to walk alongside our groups. We have to set the table for them to, to do their, their thing and really trust them. And that's the approach that we bring here at MVP always. And, and we would just love for you all to, to really walk alongside us and support this work uh, in the ways that our uh, groups, our partner grantees, our communities really need. So I, I encourage you, if you haven't donated, you know, please like think about it, share what you can. Um, if you, you know, have any questions, we have an amazing donor advising team who can answer those questions or do follow up with. And um, again, just really thank you so much for, for everything. I think we're done. Thanks everyone. <laughs>